that as well. The good, you know, the great, not good, great Mexican food in, in San Antonio, home of, Absolutely. I forget, they've got a special kind of, uh, I'm going to, I'm not going to get the, the it's a, some kind of taco that um, only found <laughs> there. That sounds good. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, speaking of lunchtime, why don't we get mm-hmm. going so that people have time to have lunch? Is that okay with you? As long as they're muted, I can't hear them eating. Absolutely. All right, cool. Well, we'll get going. Uh, formal good afternoon to everyone, and I guess I should say good morning if you are on the West Coast or somewhere in between. Uh, thanks for being here for today's Bloomerang webinar, The Big Diff, Writing for Digital. And my name is Stephen Shattuck, and I am the Chief Engagement Officer over here at Bloomerang, and I'll be moderating today's discussion, as always. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get going. I want to let you all know that we are recording this presentation. Uh, so if you have to leave early or perhaps you want to review the content later on, uh, have no fear. Of course, we don't want you to leave early, but if you have to, you'll be able to watch that recording. I'll send that out a little later on this afternoon, as well as the slides if you didn't already get those. Uh, but the most important thing is if you have questions or comments, please feel free to send them over uh, on that chat screen. Uh, I'll be taking a look at those, and we're going to try to save just as much time as we can for Q&A at the end. Um, so don't be shy. Don't sit on those hands. And if you have any technical problems, I'll be, uh, I'll be looking out for those chats as well and responding to you uh, as I can. Uh, you can also send us messages on Twitter. You can use the hashtag uh, Bloomerang. Our username is at Bloomerang Tech. I'll be keeping an eye on that as well. Uh, throughout the hour or so. And if this is your first webinar with us, I just want to say a special extra uh, welcome to you. We do do these webinars just about every Thursday. We bring on a great guest like Tom. It's one of, one of my favorite things that we do here at Bloomerang for sure. But if you're not familiar with Bloomerang, our, our core business is donor management software. And if you are in the market for that or maybe you just want to learn more about us, you can check out our website. There's even a short video demo that you can watch uh, and get a, get a glimpse of our uh, software. Don't even have to talk to a salesperson if you don't want to. So check that out after the presentation concludes if you are interested. Uh, but for now, I am so excited to introduce my personal hero, a role model of mine, uh, the world's foremost expert on donor communications. Tom Ahern is with us today. Hey, Tom, how's it going? Well, good. I had no idea I was any of those things. Thank you, Stephen. Oh, yes, you did. Stop it. I'm going to brag ah. on you because uh, Tom's pretty <laughs> modest. Um, I, I doubt that many of you don't know Tom very well, but just in case he is new to you, um, he truly is considered to be uh, one of the top experts in donor communications. The New York Times said it themselves a couple of years ago, so it must be true. Uh, he is the author of four awesome books, uh, Donor Newsletters, How to Write Fundraising Materials, uh, Seeing Through a Donor's Eyes. Uh, he is a frequent international speaker and trainer. In fact, this is really special. He cut out this hour for us uh, on his way uh, to Canada for a week-long stretch, so very appreciative that he could make the time for us here today. Uh, he is an advisory board member for the Hartsook Center for Sustainable Philanthropy. Uh, which is uh, a think tank that Adrian Sargent started over in Plymouth University in the UK. Uh, he is, he's my hero. He's a poet, he's an artist, and he's a genius. And I'm going to pipe down because we want to hear from Tom, not Stephen. So Tom, uh, take it away, my friend. Tell us all about <laughs> digital copywriting. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to, uh, how do I get in charge of advancing the slide, Stephen? You are in charge. If you just double click them, they'll move. Okay. So now, um, is there a way to make that full screen? Just hit the full maximize, wouldn't it? Yeah. That, and it'll be full screen that. for the attendees for sure. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's go back. There you go. I just want to make. All right. So that's our title slide, and uh, well, basically, this is. And I'm standing up, by the way, because we now know that sitting is the new smoking. And so I'm doing all my <laughs> webinars standing up. And um, anyway, what is not different? Obviously, words and pictures are the basic ingredients of our communications work. And I just want to say my perspective on digital 
is the, that of a copywriter. So a copywriter is paid to get results, uh, sales, you know, or bring in gifts for uh, fundraising copywriting. And, um, and you have words and pictures. Now, that's nothing changed. They, they, the digital, so-called digital revolution, um, for actors like it, me, copywriters, people that have to send out messaging and hope for a response, um, they, all it did is add channels for us. Uh, and channels in some opportunities, but what, what isn't different? Let's look at some of these things that aren't different between digital and print. Um, first of all, you know, what kind of content are you putting in front of me? Well, uh, one thing that I will be reliably interested in is anything that takes me on a journey to some place I otherwise will not go, and I'm, you're going to show me something interesting. Or content that reinforces my values, that says to me, yeah, I, this, this has been a problem that I worry about, and now we're finally getting something done about it. Or I read the news, and I'm horrified and upset and I am at least helping a little bit. Uh, what's not different, you're, you're really talking to eyeballs all the time. So the eyeballs are the symbol, the connection to the brain. That's how we get into people's brains um, or through their ears. We're looking for a group of people to become true believers. I'm going to get back to that in a second. Uh, attention spans are shrinking. That's science. Um, we need to focus on monthly giving. Again, science. We now, a couple of years ago, had you asked the question, should you try to get acquire new donors on monthly giving? Uh, people, experts like Harvey McKinnon would say, eh, I'd, I'd go no. The answer is no. Make that a second option, and they'll get to it. These days, and this is in part because of research that came out from Blackboard, and you're going to see some of that, um, you really want to take your new donors and get them right into monthly giving if you can, because it solves one problem right away, which is getting a second gift. Most of the time, the second gift is built in if they sign up as a monthly donor. And if they, you do get a second gift, they're much more likely to hang on longer. Uh, frequency, yeah, you, you know, the, the uh, secret to advertising is not cleverness. The secret to advertising is repetition and just keep hammering the same message over and over and over. Uh, headlines, your big type are going to do a ton of the work, so make sure you know how to write an interesting headline. Or interest, uh, headline, I get hooked right away. I have to know more. Um, you need to know how to write offers, digital or print. Those are your calls to action here. Would you do this is what you're presenting to me. And finally, uh, making an emotional connection is all important. Now, in print, you have a couple of extras that, that you can exploit. First of all, it is what you'd call high touch. In other words, I've got a piece of paper in my hands, and I'm rubbing it, and I'm feeling it, and that you can take advantage of. Um, if it's something uh, interesting, I can put it on the refrigerator like your, your kids aren't. And it is kind of quieter. The, um, the digital realm is very active. And so instead of just words and pictures, you have video and you have audio. I can hear stuff. I can see stuff moving. And I, you know, we're watching all these little micro videos and we're clicking on stuff. Oh, we love to click on stuff. And so it's a very action-oriented environment. And you take advantage of that and you also realize that in some ways that can be a limitation because my, uh, my already brief attention span is now getting chopped up even finer and finer and finer. All right, so those are what's different, what isn't different. Who's the donor? And this, um, when I started in copywriting, I did not have an answer to this. And so I asked around, and then I also had more uh, experience over the years. And so I, I eventually, uh, this comes out of a book that you can get for free from my website. You can see the address there. It's a downloadable PDF called 20 Questions. And in there are, well, how many questions? I wonder. No, 20 questions, <laughs> of course. And, uh, but these are common questions that I think it's important to have a well-grounded answer to. Otherwise, you're kind of driving all over the place, and you don't know, you know where, where are the lines on the road here. Um, 
So how old is your average American donor? And that would be the same for Canada, and it's roughly the same for Australia, and it's roughly the same for the UK, Ireland. Um, 35, 55, 75, and the answer is 75 years of age. Now, when I started as a copywriter in fundraising, that wouldn't have been my guess. I would have probably averaged and said, oh, yeah, probably, eh, I don't know, 55, 45, I don't know, something. I didn't have a clear picture in my head. You have to have a clear picture in your head of who you're writing to, digital or print, because that's the person you're trying to persuade. That's the person you're trying to have a conversation with. And this woman is exactly the right demographic. And the sign she's holding up, thank you, Mark Phillips of Blue Frog in London, is what she wants you to do for her. So here's, uh, when you see the little guy here in the in lab coat, he, that means we're talking data science and other things. I try not to have opinions in my my work. I try to just have data I can rely on. And here's some data from TrueSense, which is one of the bigger um, direct mail fundraising firms based in the United States, does a lot of national campaigns, sitting on a mountain of data. And uh, donors by age. So what's the biggest slice of pie? 46% are people 65 and older. Next slice of pie, 55 through 64. So between 55 and up, you've got two-thirds of your donor base. Now, this has implications. Um, it isn't because older people are more natively generous than younger people. It's because older people have some surplus income they can afford to give away, and it will not change their lifestyle one iota. See, when you're building your life, so the people 35 and under, small slice of pie, 35 to 44, 11%, 45 to 54, 17%, when you're building your life and you're, you know, you're maybe raising a family, uh, acquiring things like a home, so forth. You have a lot of expenses. Uh, you're trying to like save like crazy so that you won't have a, an awful retirement. And finally, around 55, True Sense notice this behavior. Finally, around age 55, you you have some money that you feel you can let go of into a charity. Uh, without it affecting your, you know, your own domestic uh, comfort level, and and that's why uh, we need to know who is giving us this money because we need to talk to these people clearly. Um, and here's some some backing. I just I'm going to harp on this because I I have the data now, and this is Salvation Army. This is from the Midwest uh, Army Central. And they're active donors. You can see that on the upper left. The, the largest number of active donors they have are age 87. The second largest is age 70. Um, first time, new donors. The largest group of new donors are age 70. The largest, and, and the second largest is age 61. So these are uh, <laughs> these. This should tell you something. Um, and, you know, if you've been thinking, well, anybody could be our donor, no, they they won't be. Um, here's this hospital I work for in San Diego. I do all their direct mail. And so we know to the moment, basically, when people were born, they're mostly ex-patients. And uh, I know my donors are exactly, not rounded up, exactly 75 years old. Uh, now, digital changed it a little bit. Um, the percentage of donors uh, by age, as you can see here from a 101 fundraising post, it's a little um, younger, a little younger, not, you know, not horribly, a lot younger to, until you get to the top band 75 uh, plus. By the way, you'll see these little uh, balloons that say, I subscribe. These are the the uh, posts, the blogs, professional blogs that I personally do subscribe to and read on a regular basis in order to learn all the cool stuff that other people are able to teach us. Um, they're online, a little bit wealthier, and uh, online, a little bit less loyal to. They, they come and go more quickly online than they do offline. All right, so there's some, you know, some comparisons. Uh, I, 
I was talking to some top person from uh, Charity Water earlier in this year, and I was surprised to hear because, you know, Charity Water, some people would say they basically reinvented fundraising, and they certainly became a large, um, useful charity very quickly uh, in the 2000s. They do, they basically outsourced um, fundraising to their donors. So, you know, you, you, every, we all have a birthday every year. So you want to take your birthday and do something useful with it, then you can use your birthday to raise money for charity water, um, which is what a lot of people do. Or they have some other family event or some, whatever. And charity water aggregates tons of donations this way. But the average lifespan of the charity water donor is 14 months. They do it once, and that's it. So um, those people are coming in the door, and then they're going out the door. Uh, Charity Water is now moving into monthly giving because that is not, um, you know, the greatest sustainable business model. Not that, you know, the country, I mean, just the U.S. has 330 million people. You're not going to run out of birthdays anytime soon. But still, they want a donor to be with them for longer than 14 months. And um, so I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Here is Greenpeace. Right. You go to their homepage. Now, this is their homepage before the U.S. presidential election in November. It has changed now because um, they suddenly have a different enemy that they can, you know, clearly point people at and say, "This is what we have to defeat." This, you know, idea, for instance, of that global warming is just—I don't know—it's just an opinion. Anyway, um, so you go to Greenpeace, and what pops up before you can go anywhere on their homepage is this interrupter. Um, and it, here, it had a child with Greenpeace on his forehead. You make our work possible. Donate today. Greenpeace is very clear about what they want. This is called anchoring. This is, you know, whatever I say to you first is the thing that is the most important. Now, that may, you can actually work with that concept. That's a a concept from persuasion and linguistics and psychology. But um, it's what what are you putting first? You know, go to your website. What are you putting first? If it isn't fundraising, then you're, that's not the thing that people are going to be most responsive about. Um, When you click on that, you go inside, and uh, the Greenpeace um, giving page is stacked this way. First of all, join the movement. So that's this group of uh, merry troublemakers that are going to make some problem uh, better. And what do they want first? Well, they make that quite clear. They put it in a box. It's got a yellow tint behind it. They put it, uh, I want to become a monthly supporter. They, that's what Greenpeace wants you to choose. Or you can make a single donation. Now, look what Greenpeace did, though. They have, as their giving string, um, the smallest amount is the first amount in the monthly sporting. So you think, oh, $12. I could probably afford that. That's a couple of Starbucks. Or... Well, I'm not sure I'm ready for monthly giving. I'll make a single donation. What's the first amount there? 500 At which point your brain goes, I don't think so. I am not ready for a $500 gift, uh, is anybody. And uh, so I'm going back to that $12 offer. And, uh, and this is, you know, in my view, um, this is them being super genius and kind of shaping your behavior. So... Uh, Black Bot Sustainers of Focus. This is what we learned in May 2017 when the agitator um, published the results. Um, ask new donors for monthly gifts right away. Don't, don't do it second. Do it first. Um, keep converting them to monthly giving. That's what a sustainer is, a monthly donor. Uh, make monthly giving your website default, et cetera, et cetera. The, the, this new leaning toward monthly giving solves many problems. It solved lots of problems in Australia. They just did it a different approach. We don't have, in the United States anyway, <clears throat> and um, I, I know it's big in England, huge in Australia, what's called street fundraising, peer-to-peer, on the street, you know, people in their 30-somethings, 20 something sometimes, um, kind of approaching other people in the same demographic, um, 
and signing them up right there on the street for credit card monthly deposits. Well, in the United States, you don't see a lot of that compared to other countries, but in, the, in Australia, it's why they have such a huge number of monthly giving uh, donors. All right. Well, anyway, where are we now with online giving? So let's look at the data. Um, we've got a record amount coming in through online, pure online giving. You, know, you send me an email, I click through to the website, I make a gift. And yet, even though this is a record high as of last year, and it will be a record high again this year and a record high again next year, it is still in the single digits. And it's not going to jump from 7.2 to like 25% next year. It's going to go from 7.2 to 7.3 or 7.4. It is slowly moving in that direction because of the, um, the penetration of all things digital into our daily lives and the convenience factor that digital offers compared to, let's say, writing a check. And so, yeah, we will continue to move in that direction, but we, you, you're not behind, <laughs> I guess is the, the thing I want to say to anybody who's kind of, a, kind of nervous about this. You're not behind. There's still time. All right, why do we have to be digital? Let's go back to eye, eyeball. See the picture in the background there? See all those devices that are being held up in the air? Take a, a, a photo of something? You have to be digital because that's where my eyes are. And no matter what, you know, if I if I were reading, you know, hieroglyphics, you'd have to be there in the hieroglyphics because that's where my eyes are. These days, you have to be where my, you know, where my eyes are now being drawn to all the time, which is digital. Uh, this Attention Merchants, the book in the middle there, Tim Wu, fascinating book about how we have gone from, um, you know, basically the calligraphy days. Uh, Sheena, you might be interested in this. Back, you know, we went from, we copied a book one book at a time to, uh, Mar you know, uh, Gutenberg. Now we have the printing industry uh, comes along and then mass marketing comes along and then newspapers come along and then you know it's just one all of it is trying to do one thing which is to get my attention because that's the portal to my uh credit card okay so finally kind of wrapping up this section is digital the answer if you've been thinking oh well finally we can you know fundraising is easy and free no it's actually harder because now you have to understand all these other channels you you kind of you know a lot of us in, uh, grew up on paper uh, now we have the new generation uh, digital natives they grew up online um, but online is still fairly new. I mean, the, the, the Gutenberg brought in printing around 1440, so we've had a long time to figure out print. Digital, we didn't really see that until the mid-90s, and that means we're only, you know, whatever we are, 17, 18, 25 years in. Um, we don't really get, understand this tool. And, uh, and everything sounds like it is going to be brilliant and change the world. And most of it, nobody else can repeat. Um, so, for all of you, it's no—it's not either or, digital or print. It is both. And uh, here's Tina Sincotti, and she's a very accomplished um, copywriter, consultant for fundraising. And this is what she does for her clients now as a standard pack. There's going to be your solicitation letter, first bullet. It has the typical stuff, the direct mail, reply device, um, et cetera, buck slip, lift note. And um, she's going to have acknowledgement letters as part of her standard pack. So when people um, send a gift in, they get a professionally written thank you rather than a trite, you know, uh, on behalf of the board of directors of so-and-so. We want to thank you for your gift. Our robot said we had to. And... Um, and and then, but look what's bullet number three. Also, email appeals and web content are part of her standard pack these days. Not just the direct mail, the physical, but also the electronic messaging. All right, take a quick look at Facebook, where we are with that. Uh, Soy Dog, amazing operation. Uh, 
based in Bangkok, Thailand, uh, making a $350,000 a month from Facebook fundraising alone. That's that's pretty amazing, given that you know I, there are very few other charities that are making any significant money um, from Facebook. Now, was it? Was it easy? No. It took them six years of research and development working with Pareto, um, the, the Australia's biggest direct mail and telephone fundraising house, six years of trying stuff to figure it out. <laughs> but they did. And here's how they, here's how they raise money from Facebook. They, um, they have a petition. Now, if you're an animal lover uh, or you're, you're a cruelty hater, uh, you sign that petition. And um, now they've, you know, they have your uh, your signature. They also ask for your email address, and they'll ask for some other information too. None of which uh, you have to enter. The signature is is the entry point. About, you know, you can see there, um, ha you know, some percentage uh, give Soy Dog their email address, which allows Soy Dog to now to continue to solicit them with email. And um, they they start that, and they also, if you gave them their phone, call you. Uh, and eventually, what you see here, this 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 ratio from the tallest bar to the bars that are labeled ask, 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 uh, 1.400 million people signed a petition to end the dog meat trade in Southeast Asia. Out of that 1.4 million people who said, yeah, this is horrible, I want to do something about it, so here's my signature. Uh, about 41,000 became donors, and of those 41,000, about 5,000 became RGs, regular givers, which is just the Australian name for monthly givers. So you can see the ratio. You, you start with this non-monetary offer that brings in a ton of people, and then from that ton of people, you will get a, a certain percentage who will say yes. Now, the, the percentage for soy dog, remember, this is in Bangkok, Thailand. Soy dog is uh, getting most of its money from females in the United States, 45 and older, and then from females in the UK, 45 and older, and then females in Canada, 45 and older, and then females in Australia, 45 and older. That's what you can do with Facebook that you cannot do with any other kind of fundraising, um, you can reach a world audience for an obscure charity doing something interesting in another part of the world. Okay, um, here's a typical ad for Soy Dog, and um, what's what's odd about this? One of the things they discovered in the six years of R and D was that the kind of ad they had to write could have been written by a, a professional copywriter in the 1940s because it's a very straightforward. That's why you have that cover: that how to write a good advertisement. That's all you need to read in order to write Facebook advertising, and that was published in mm, 1963 or something. Uh, you start with your little story. Attacked by so many, I've never been so scared. I didn't know how it was going to end. I'm a street dog called Twaddle, etc. See more. Stop. Stop talking. A couple of lines is all you need. Photo. That's your eye candy. Photo brings me in, you know, physically, literally, because we know from uh, eye motion studies that the, any big image is going to be something I have to stare at. And right beneath it is the offer. Only you can make a difference for street dogs that have nobody else. Please click here to help. That's it. So um, at Pareto, they call these fluff. That's your story, but you can't just do fluff, and that's what a lot of charities are doing. They, they have half the story. They have the fluff. They don't have the bite. The bite is where you go in and go, yes, and you do need to do something about it. It's the oldest form of charity uh, fundraising. Okay, so some um, some more advice, and all this advice is going to be yours, I think, somehow, and um, Stephen will explain all that, uh, because you're going to forget most of it by tomorrow, except for those of you that can't stop coming to hear me speak, in which case you've heard this a thousand times. Um, and these are checklists that you can uh, go back to and say, oh, yeah, 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 that we need to do it that way. Um, Kivy, subscribe to her. 
she she brought to my attention the AARP's uh, rule of one for Facebook posts: one photo, one sentence, one link, one request from readers, and that's uh, three times a day. And um, that's well researched. That's not somebody's guess. That's what they found worked best. Um, e-newsletters: like we can adapt the AARP formula for your e-newsletter, as the Canadian Red Cross did here. And what you're looking at is the thing that succeeded better than what they had been sending out. The thing that they had been sending out was a, more of a long copy. You know, you, this, it wouldn't have been just a couple of, you know, a handful of words, a couple of paragraphs. It would have been, you know, 250, 300, 400 words. Um, that's what they replaced with what you see on the screen. And that's based kind of on the AARP. It has the, the one photo, Mustafa. And uh, <clears throat> it has the uh, it has a little micro story. It, you've, you've got him testifying when I was confirmed as positive with Ebola. I thought it wouldn't survive, and yet, um, I, and yet, he is alive today thanks to your support. Now I've circled the U's with red so that you can see how frequent they are, and there's something to click on because you have to have something to click on in a digital environment. That's what it's about. It's about clicking and going and seeing something different. Let's look at email. Uh, Kivi, thank you for this checklist. So all of you will read it before you send out another email. And here's some good advice from John Hayden. Again, probably the guy I subscribe to with most enthusiasm on the digital side. And he's always got something to say. You know, So here he's talking about how Charity Water uses stories uh, in their email. Here's uh, how you can personalize the email so that it's about me, not about the organization. You wrote, you shared, you gave, you rallied with your kids. Um, here's, uh, tell me what the money is. Give me something, a picture in my head. Give me a little story in my head. A little, I'm watching this, you know, tw I'm giving 25 bucks, and now I can see a chimpanzee's x-ray. And about the only thing that I would change there is I, I think I'd have an x-ray of a chimpanzee instead of a chimpanzee, without, you know, the, the outside of a chimpanzee. But uh, hey, that's, you know, you can always make things different. Um, what else we got? Oh, ask three times, John says. So you can see, very, not a big piece of text here, not a big ad, but donate now, donate, and make a gift today. Um, and everything in there is, you know, otherwise supporting why they need your help. Um, some more success tips, blah, blah, blah. You'll look at them in the future. Let's look at uh, what is the purpose of email and Facebook. Well, I was surprised by the answer to that. And uh, the answer is the purpose of email and Facebook is to send people somewhere else, to your website, basically. And uh, on the website, they can do all sorts of things. So here's Habitat. They get this email, and it has the gold thermometer, and that's good. And it says, donate now. And it, points in our direction, and so you click through, and here's where you go. You go to a landing page, which is uh, looks the same, so it has a kind of, you know, yeah, I'm in the right place. Uh, it's a coherent message, um, and you make your choice, you know, and what do they put first? Monthly giving. Here's some other stuff that you can, you know, have people do on your website, and uh, and you know the the list is endless. I, I it, it's sorry. This is all I could fit onto this slide. Um, okay, let's look at the purpose of an email subject line again. I'm talking to here as a copywriter. So somebody's asked me to do a series of emails. What's the thing that is most important? Well, it's the email subject line. If it's if that's how we're attempting to raise money, because I've got to get that. It, it's kind of like the the headline on an ad. You know, I'm. The ad is going nowhere if I do not engage somehow emotionally with that headline. Um, we are so over-solicited. Look at what you do every morning, because I'm pretty sure what I do every morning, which is to open my email inbox and as fast as possible delete everything I possibly can. So, you know, just clear it out of my world. Uh, this, you know, I'm getting at, on average 147 emails a day. So are you. It, it, getting through that mob and saying, uh, "Oh, by the way, would you give us a gift?" 
that is tough. And and here's the results. This is a great report. It comes out every year from M plus R benchmarking on digital. And for every one thousand emails, fundraising emails that are sent out, the organization raises forty bucks. Wow, forty bucks. And actually it's shrinking. So that was then and this year it's thirty eight bucks for every thousand. Um, I was in Tucson. I was speaking to a room full of fundraisers. We kind of, you know, quickly estimate how many emails you sent out in the last 12 months. And the highest number we had there was 96,000 emails in 12 months. And what would that turn into? Well, it turns into less than $4,000 in gifts. So, you know, the volume of your email, <laughs> it's just something to think about. This is math at some level. It's always going to be math. And so what is the correct math? Um, the job of uh, email, just like in direct mail, in direct mail the job of an envelope is not to protect the content. The job of an envelope is to get opened. In email, the job number one of your subject line is to get the darn thing open. So you need to be very... You know, let's try stuff. If you have a 30% opening rate, yeah, they like hearing from you. If you have a 15%, you're not all that welcome, and they're just not expecting much from you. So here's a list of, of subject lines that I opened relatively recently. Um, here on the top one, not safe for work, sex lives of the white-throated sparrow. Yeah, I, I know, I but I, I just wanted to know. I mean, what, did they have a big wonderful sex life? I don't know. Anyway, uh, here's Houston Grand Opera. They are making this offer. They're going to take the story of your romance and turn it into an opera. They do a lot of commissioned work there at Houston Grand Opera. Fabulous idea. Here's AFP in uh, uh, Dallas-Fort Worth. This one comes in. You equals awesome. We equals grateful. Yeah, got to find out why. Hey, I want more of that. That's a lollipop. Um, and so forth and so on, so forth and so on. These are ones I opened um, because the subject line. Here's another one I, I opened. Finally, a great use for snow. I live in the Northeast, and uh, and you know it just was relevant to me. <laughs> uh, now, President Obama's 2012 campaign uh, was notable for many reasons, one of which was it did raise a ton of money online. $690 million were raised online it, through emails, right? Um, emails that sent me somewhere to make a gift. And the, the thing that's interesting about their subject lines, you can see the top 15 money makers here, is why are these working? It, the insiders couldn't predict, by the way. They, <laughs> they always got it wrong. The thing they hated worked best. The thing they loved didn't work at all, etc. This is why you have to keep trying stuff. Don't go with what you think will work. Go with something you don't think will work, perhaps. Um, and so look at these. I've made the pronouns red so that you can see this is a, ca a characteristic of many of these top money-making subject lines. I want to do this again. This is the President of the United States. My place, June 14th, me again. I love you back. You know, it's, it's personal. It's warmer, um, not distance. You, know, you don't want distance. You want to bring people closer to you. Also, the subject lines for Obama's campaign were short, as you can see. All right, a couple of guidelines you could try yourself. Um, having some urgency helps me to get past the biggest problem in fundraising, which is my native inertia. It's so much easier not to do anything than it is to do something. So give me a countdown to save Angel. Angel will be back soon, by the way. Um, oh, send this to me. Thank you, you wonderful person. Well, of course I'm going to open that. Uh, here's one that uh, somebody uh, shared in one of the workshops. This is the one that they use. It always gets the biggest opening. You're a hero. Here's why. Um, or, hey, at least didn't say an old goat named Tom Ahern. And uh, I opened this up. The personalization got me. By the way, the great piece of information here, what are the most effective email closing? And you can see that when the closing was thanks in advance, 
there was a 38.3% bomb in um, in response rate. <laughs> so thanks in advance. I mean, it's, in some ways, what you're doing with that is modeling their behavior and saying, "Yeah, I know you're you're that kind of person. You're that kind of generous, compassionate person. You will do this." So thanks in advance. Um, email job number two. Remind me that I am part of something. I remind me I am part of some some wonderful thing. Here, the goat named Tom Hearn. Um, I'm joining a herd when I respond to this. Now, this was so cute that I basically, by the time, I just looked the goat in the eye, kid, and I uh, saw the voice balloon. Hello, my name is Tom Hearn. I'm a big uh, proponent of voice balloons on animals. And I see all this personalization. I circled all the, the examples of that in red so you could see all the personalization. Basically, within you know a couple of seconds, I said, uh, I don't care what you're asking for. I'm going to give it to you. Um, so why? Because it gave me a story to tell. I just told it to you. And we're back to our iconic donor. And so maybe she's a monthly giver to Greenpeace. And she's thinking, I save a polar bear every month. Maybe she, you know, wants to, her self-image all her life has been, I want to be a nice, good person, a decent person, and uh, help be a help, helpful to the world. Giving allows her to say, I met, that, I met my self-qualification. I am that decent person. Giving may allow her to say, you know, I, I, I follow the scriptures. I'm... A, Jesus said, do this, and I am trying to be good at this. And, uh, and charity allows her to say that. Or she reads the newspaper, gets to totally crazy upset because of the millions of people displaced into refugee camps outside of Syria, and she just wants to help, and she does, and she sends a check. So she's got these stories where she has been the actor and that's what you need to emphasize over and over and over, that I am part of, your, of this family of doing something worth doing. Now, this was the recruiting poster for World War I. Six million um, Brits were mobilized based on this, and 700,000 of them died. This is no different. This is a, a Planned Parenthood asking you to join a capital campaign. Will you help? Will you help uh, young women like that? Um, what all of this stuff is trying to create in some sense is, is what is called in psychology a synthetic family. It's a group of kind of self-organizing group of people that get together to do something. That's why Greenpeace talks about join the movement. The movement is what is the synthetic family, and we're going to get something done. Um, and I just wanted to bring up, you know, email segmentation, uh, very important that you try to find as fast as possible who the true believers are versus the lesser believers, because where the money really is, is with the true believers. Um, and you will never have that many of them. Now, here's Jay Love, the founder of Bloomerang, uh, sharing some data that has been collected there. 88% of dollars raised come from 12% of the donors. This is a key fact because, I, for me, what this meant, and this has really changed my focus, uh, what this meant for me was you've got to sort people into two groups as fast as you can, into the group that is you know, really kind of identified with you um, and feel strongly, and the others. Because the others, you they, they're, fine, they're lovely people and we are grateful for the help, but those are the ones that give one gift and never give again. Those are the ones that quit after a couple of years. Those are the ones that jump from charity to charity because they're philanthropically inclined, they, but you turned out to be not a very interesting charity, so they move on. Um, you're looking for the people that really care because that's where 88% of your money is actually coming from. Jeff Brooks, um, wisest man in fundraising. Donors don't give to support your programs. Frankly, they couldn't hear less about your, the details and that's a bullshit program. What they are trying to bring into their lives is a sense that something they help make something happen. And 
it's really your job as communicators, digital or print, to continuously feed that hunger to make something happen. Next after a great organization just coming into the nonprofit world out of the business to business marketing world, and they are looking here, they're just, you know, why do people give? Well, look at those faces. They're all ages, they're gender, they're different races, and you know, they they give for their own reasons because they you know, they have hope. They want to protest against something. They want something to change, damn it, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay, so taking that, those are all emotional connections with those people. What are you going to do? You're going to have your donate button just like every other, you know, 30 million donate buttons, or are you going to ask me to actually feel something? This is for the uh, Center for Constitutional Rights in New York City, and they are big into the social justice. They were big into the civil rights movement in the 1960s and continue in that world. And w the people that come to their website, why are they coming? Well, they're coming because they're really angry about something in society. And w what this group does is goes to court and tries to fix that. So if you're outraged, donate. What's your adjective? Um, here are some typical emotional triggers. If you're a professional copywriter, you're working with these day in, day out, day in, day out. It's really kind of all you think about. Um, how can I use anger? How about exclusivity? That would be you know the um, the president's circle is exclusivity. Uh, etc. Now, it is important that you don't follow your instincts, which is to rub the corners off and uh, to turn down the drama and make everything smiley because you have an amygdala and so does every one of your donors. And uh, that amygdala is also known as the lizard brain. It had two thoughts originally. Can I eat it? Will it kill me? And the will it kill me thought is it leads your brain to be fear based and um, and attentive. Now these days you don't have to worry about you know uh, a, a, a saber toothed tiger dragging you off. You, what you worry about, unless you live in Alaska, what you worry about is um, is other things. But you you know you just, life is tense, and that. Negative emotions, because they are linked to survival, will bring me uh, more quickly into some kind of you know connection with your charity's message and mission. Um, good research from the American Marketing Association: photo of a sad child raises 50% more than a photo of a happy or a photo of a neutral child. So you have USA for you and HCR. Don't turn your back on this child. That is. It's fundraising 101. That's how Oxfam grew from a small group of people around a, a pub table into a worldwide force for doing good with ads like this. Um, you are trying to connect with what's already in their heads. Richard Radcliffe, buddy. So we're stumbling out of a bar in Amsterdam, and he is um, telling me about his experiences. He's interviewed over 25,000 donors about their reasons for giving, and he said, quote, unquote, I wrote it right down, right that moment, donors are staggeringly ignorant of the causes they support, only in a cute British accent. And um, what he meant by that was not, oh, woe is us, we have to teach them. He, he really meant lucky us. We don't have to teach them anything. They're already uh, pretty much there. Um, they may be ignorant, according you know, to that statement. What they have, though, are their own values, their own interests, their own beliefs, all these things that happen to them during their lives, the secrets, lost loves, regrets, fears, hopes, anger, blah, blah, blah. We also have built in empathy, one of the few animals that does. So it's all there. They're already 99.9% .9 of the way there. You just have to bring an offer to them that makes sense to them. Oh, I, you know, 25, I can afford that, yeah. And, and I'll be helping find the cure for cancer, or I'll be, you know, helping with this, or I'll be a good member and up, upstanding member of my local community, uh, etc. You're looking in writing, in copy, for always for mental nods, because a mental nod is a values match. That's where we connect. 
And that idea comes from Dr. Siegfried Vergula, Munich, and he was doing eye motion studies. And those studies, um, the, the, people were reading direct mail, and he was watching them, what well, cameras were. And what he noticed was that they would occasionally nod as they read. So there was an agreement, and it was physical. He could actually see it. But it led him to the thought, we need as many mental nods as possible, because that's an agreement. And it doesn't have to be a physical nod, but they have to mentally say, yeah, I, I do agree with that, or yeah, that is a problem. So here's PETA, P People for the Ethical Treatments of Animals, um, and they have this statement at the top of their website, animals are not ours to eat, wear, experiment on, use for entertainment, or abuse in any other way. If you read that and go, uh-huh, I totally agree, that's your mental nod moment, at which point you've got eye contact with the bunny and the donate button in contrasting color so you can see it easily. All donor communications, digital or print, have a job. You're, you're coming into my home. Are you going to be a good guest or a bad guest? Good guest will be white, invited back. Bad guest sits down, feet up on coffee table, starts talking about himself for the next 20 minutes. Nobody wants that guest to come back. The good guest comes in and says, what a gorgeous, lovely, warm, welcoming, friendly, loving home you have here. I can see you've made it a, a, a temple of you know, affection. for your, and, and I just love being here. It feels so nice. When you come into my, the privacy of my head and my home and you make me feel good, I will want you to come back over and over and over. And that's really all you need to do in donor communications is make me feel good, make me proud, make me uh, feel wanted, make me feel important, um, entertain me, take me someplace, take me on a journey to something I wouldn't otherwise see. So that brings us to your donation landing page, which uh, may have a clothespin on it. Because Jeff Brooks has said this, and uh, Jeff, of course, is 100% uh, true all the time. Every time I look at an online fundraising program that ain't going anywhere, it's because of poorly built giving pages. So how is your giving page? Well, why don't you take this 10-lesson free online e-course from uh, Network for Good, run by Karen Stein. I just took it. It was great. teaches you everything you really need to know about having a great giving page. This is one of the things it will teach you. Uh, your donation page has an emotionally compelling image that captures the mission. So this is one of the oldest children's hospitals in America, CHOP, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And uh, here's the mom and the child with cancer because she doesn't have any hair. And uh, but on versus here's Joe's kids. You know Joe's kids is a wonderful charity in uh, Indiana, North West Indiana. And yet I went to their donation page and I said, hmm, gee, I kind of just lost my enthusiasm. Where's the cute kid that I was just looking at? Gone. Um, do you really need my help? Not answered. Uh, gee, I really want another form in my life. No, I don't. Uh, and, of course, we want monthly giving because it's better for the charity, so why is monthly giving the right thing to do? It turns out people love monthly giving because it's actually more convenient for them. Email job number three, clicking through to do something. Give me something important to do. Here's this formula developed by Stephen Pigeon. He's a uh, UK. He uh, built uh, the country, one of the country's larger direct mail fundraising firms called Tangible. It started in his living room, and when he sold it, it had 400 employees. So they were really good at what they did. And uh, Stephen, this formula he shares with the world, this is the four-part formula they used at Tangible in order to raise money. You have the vision. Where we, do we want to go? Well, cure cancer, yeah. Uh, feed all the people that are hungry today. Uh, those are your visions. The enemy is whatever stands in the way of making that vision a reality. Um, the served are the, the hungry kids that now have a meal. And, of course, in red I put it, the hero. The hero is you, the donor, in cooperation, in collaboration with the charity doing this good work. So here... Save Angel from a lifetime of hell. There's Angel again. Uh, any questions? Save Angel from a lifetime of hell. And that's 
you know, there's the enemy. What am I going to defeat? I'm going to save Angel from a lifetime of hell. Viktor Frankl survived the Nazi death camps, unlike the rest of his family. He was already a, a well-known psychiatrist in Vienna, Jewish, unfortunately, so that, that's why he ended up in those camps. And, um, but he noticed something in the camps. And he was surrounded by 16,000 corpses when he was liberated. He, what he saw in the camps was if somebody had purpose, it didn't matter if it was a big purpose or a little purpose. Any purpose would get them up in the morning. Um, they, they would live longer. So he said this, Humans are driven uh, by this need to establish meaning. They need purpose. Now, that's one thing that you as a charity can bring into my life is a sense of purpose. Let's look at, finally, Donor Communications 101. What are you doing? You ask for my help. You thank me for my help. And then you report to me what you did with my help and the help of others. Charities tend to focus too much on the asking part because they're just completely obsessed and mesmerized by how much money can we bring in and how soon. That's the part the donor, the person, see her there again, doesn't care about. <laughs> this is the money she can afford to give away, and it does not change her lifestyle. What she does care about is, are you grateful? And what did I do? What did philanthropy do? Is the world a better place? Your thanks and your newsletters, digital or print, are your hugs. This is how you reach out from this agency and you just wrap me in your arms and say, thank you for existing. We are so appreciative. Here's my final slide. This is a thank you. It's from Crisis Aid International, a small faith-based uh, charity that does incredibly nice stuff for incredibly difficult situations in or around the world. This one happens to be talking about Ethiopia. And uh, I circled all the thanks. There are seven of them in this. And, and what I want to say to you now is I will always open the emails from Crisis Aid. I will always open the emails from Nyaka School, which is a Uganda school for HIV AIDS orphans because of the way they're written and because of the way they make me feel. They tell me a little story. What did my money do? Well, I went, uh, got a girl off the streets um, in Ethiopia. She's now safe in a refuge home. She had been in the C in the PS. Uh, she was 19 years old, and, or is 19 years old, and spent five years trapped in the red light district. But, you know, I get the credit. They're not claiming the credit. I get the credit. And thank you for bringing that into my life. Okay, so we have two minutes and 39 seconds for questions. Stephen. All right, maybe we can do a couple questions. Uh, but Tom, that was, that was so awesome. Um, there was so much good advice there, so thank you. And to anyone who was seriously trying to take notes, have no fear. I'm going to send out the slides and the recording here in about a couple hours. So um, be on the lookout for that. It looks like people are loving it so far. Um, we've got a couple questions here. Tom, concerning disaster fundraising, we were talking about the hurricanes before we started. Is there any special consideration, anything you would you would advise, um, particularly for those organizations who are maybe in the midst right now or preparing to do disaster relief fundraising um, specifically? Well, I mean, make it make yourself make you an obvious place where people can go to help other people. I. I, as it happened, I looked at two different community foundation websites uh, last week. Um, so Harvey had hit, and then Irma was coming to Florida, and clearly this was, you know, going to be a horrible uh, event in a bunch of different places. And the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, which is, you know, kind of looked upon as being one of the innovators in the community foundation world. You go to their website right there on the home page right away, Hurricane Relief, how you can help. Click here, and then you go right into you know how you can help. Whereas I go mm -hmm. to a different community foundation. I won't name them because I, I, they didn't do that. They, they Basically, they just ignored <laughs> the fact that the news were filled with hurricane weather reporting. And people, you know, they, they, they have all these donor advised funds there. They should be alert to the fact that donors will be saying, what can I do, what can I do, what can I do? And instead you go to their website and it's like, never happened. So, you know, the first thing is 
make it obvious that you are a place where people can help and make it easy for yep. them to do it. All right, what else you got? Not with it. One last question since we're <laughs> running up against it. I don't want to keep people too long. Um, I'm going to kind of combine like two or three questions. So I hope the people who asked won't will forgive me. Tom, a lot of people asked about the age of donors. You gave us a lot of research that shows you know, the average donor skews older. Um, Two-part question for you. Does, does the age of the donor change any of the strategy? For example, if you know your donors are 45 and not 75, do you do anything differently? It seems like these, this advice that you've given sort of transcends age, right? I mean, compelling offers and, and you know, strong imagery. Should, should age really even factor into um, the things no, you're, you're doing here? I, no. Uh, I mean, you can be clever yeah. about it. I I've certainly read um, any article I can get which talks about the psychology of people in their older years, but as it happens, I am a person in my older years, so I don't have to look <laughs> much beyond my own day to understand what you know I think about. Um, and mm -hmm. it's just it, what you're bringing to them, and I, this is the part I don't think is, has been well exploited or understood, is that you're bringing emotional gratification to your donors. They, yep. they, you know, they, we treat them as wallets with a life support system, but that is not right. them. The, their identity is tied up with what they do, how they contribute to the world around them. And so you want to reinforce the identity. If you're the, the, the one out of 100 or 1,000 charities that makes the extra effort to thank the heck out of me and to tell me what a wonderful person I am, I'm going to stick with you longer. Yep. That's it. I could not think of a better way to, to end on. Tom, this is awesome. Thank you so much for doing this, fitting in your schedule, and, and giving such good advice. This is fun. Thank you all for thank joining you. us. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, definitely want to thank all of you, almost 300 of you, even uh, even more registrants for taking time out of your day to hang out with us. Please sign up for Tom's newsletter. It is the best newsletter that you will sign up for in your entire life. It's great. I always look forward to opening it when I see it come in. Um, lots of good advice there. You can keep learning from Tom beyond just this, uh, this webinar. Um, we've got some other resources on the Bloomerang website as well. We've got BloomCon coming up uh, in February. We've got an awesome speaker lineup. We're going to be down in Phoenix. Uh, we're also going to be in Baltimore in May of 2018. And Tom is going to join us for that BloomCon. So Check that out if one or more of those dates and times and places works for you. Check it out. It's going to be a really fun time. Um, and we've got some great webinars coming up here and over the next few weeks or so. One week from today, we're going to do a special town hall where we are going to do a 60-minute Q&A session just about fundraising challenges in the wake of natural disasters. So if you're perhaps in Texas or Florida, or somewhere along the East Coast, maybe you're in the Northwest dealing with those wildfires. Um, I'm going to have a couple of uh, disaster fundraising experts here live to take your questions. So check that out. It's going to be pretty different than what we normally do. Um, it should be uh, a lot of fun and, and very insightful. So check that out. Uh, next month we've got Claire Axelrod. She's going to talk about uh, creating a really successful fundraising appeal. So if you're working on your, your maybe your year-end appeal, your holiday appeal, uh, register for that one. It's going to be really good as well. Uh, but we'll call it a day there. So just look for an email from me with the slides and the recording. Uh, that will go out to you this afternoon. Uh, and hopefully we will see you next week or some other Thursday. So have a great rest of your, uh, your day here and a safe and fun weekend. And we'll talk to you again soon.